Hey everybody, before we get started, I just remind you this episode is brought to you by our patrons like Adam the Harp, Onika Comics, Onika Zume, Architect Ten Black is the G, Carlos, Dragon, Ferris, Jimmy Vasquez, Jonathan Sandoval, Legendary Boss Hunter, Liam Kessler, Reach of Raptor, Rogue Robin, Trevor, Shiny P, Sun Guy Nibbub, Seven Twenty Three, and Varen the Crow. If you like what we do and want to see us do more, consider supporting us on Patreon and get access to this early unless it really helps out. Thank you for your support, everybody. No manga, no mother. Hello everyone and welcome to Let's Look After You Wanted, the show where we let you know if you want to roll that five star. We're back. Yes, I know. It happens very often with story releases. I die a little bit inside. Anyway, all roads lead to Rome, so all roads must lead to our new limited SSR Lancer, Romulus Equal Quirinus. Or Romulus Quirinus. I'll probably just say it that way, because that's how it's pronounced, but there's an equal sign in the text. Anyway, if you've never watched a Wanted before, we're going to talk about a servant's real-life history and folklore, their fate lore with that capital L, all that delicious lore you know about. Also, their mechanics, as they are a gameplay unit, we'll talk about that. Some people really care about that stuff. We'll also talk about their rarity. Not their star rarity, but how frequently those rate-ups are going to be. Always a big, important factor when it comes to limited servants. Also, I'm going to warn you, this is going to have spoilers for parts of Lost Belt 5, Part 2, Olympus, in some of these sections. So, this is your final warning. If you don't want to get spoiled, and you're not done with it yet, don't watch all of this. Finish it, come back, watch it then. Watch it twice. Whatever works. All right, with that, let's dive into history. And boy, let me tell you, this history is going to be a doozy. So this servant has two parts. I put in my notes equal parts, but we'll see about that. Let's talk about them in order, though, because Romulus was a three-star unit before, so we haven't had a chance to chat about him. Anyway, Romulus is the legendary founder and first king of Rome, so he was treated as a hard historical fact by classical sources such as Livy, Plutarch, Ovid, Virgil, a lot of the guys I'm going to use for some of the sources of the folklore here. Modern scholars, as far as I can tell, think he's mostly a myth. Even his name is probably a backport in order to centralize many Roman institutions and traditions. He basically has the folkloric role of establishing like all the proper nouns and structures of what makes Rome Romy. So... It seems like a pretty obvious uh, folklorification. There probably was some guy in this slot who actually, like, decided to settle the city, but there's a lot of folklore going on here. Now, according to tradition, Romulus and his twin brother Remus are the sons of Rhea Silvia and Mars, god of war. Rhea Silvia herself is the daughter of Numitor, who was the king of Alba Longa, a nearby settlement, king of the Latinum. And he was also uh, descended from Aeneas, so following the line set out in the Aeneid, and also some other history. There were actually some uh, local Roman and Grecian scholars who said that the Roman tribes were descended from Aeneas. So that's where that slots in. Now, Numitor was betrayed and imprisoned by his brother Amulius, who killed Numitor's sons and made Rhea Silvia a vestal virgin in order for Numitor's line to die out. Uh, if you guys don't know, this was a very big deal. Vesta, the Roman version of Hestia, was... You know, very strong politically, had a very powerful mystery cult because they would send a lot of, you know, noble daughters to become cloistered vestal virgins, cloistered sisters. So there's a lot of influence there. Makes sense. Part of a theme. Basically sent her to live in a nunnery. However, Rhea is visited by Mars, by several accounts, forcefully, quote unquote. Don't want to get demonetized here. I already got enough shit to work with. And gave birth to twins. You can argue the demythified version of this is just... She, you know, appears to be pregnant and says, It was Mars! Anyway, Amulius can't have that shit, so he demands that the twins be thrown in the Tiber River. But it was flooded, so the servants couldn't do that, so they had to leave them exposed on the seven hills of Rome. By all accounts, they were suckled by a she-wolf until a shepherd found them and raised them. Very classic themes here. Pay attention to that she-wolf thing, the looper call. Anyway, when they were grown, they learned about the conflicts between Numitor and Amulius, and the shepherd, whose name was Faustulus, told them of their origins, and they ambushed and killed Amulius, restoring their grandfather to the throne, and then they set out to found their own city. You know, normal princely with hidden legacy shit. Now, unfortunately, this is where the story then leads into the death of Remus. The two brothers can't decide which hill to build their city on. There's seven hills out there. Romulus is favored by the omens. In one version, he sees 12 lucky birds or 12 divine birds, and Remus only sees like six. So he plows a square into the Palatine Hill to mark where the city walls will go, Remus, being a cheeky fuck, jumps across the walls as a deliberate insult, and in a fit of rage, Romulus kills him. Rip. Anyway, Romulus then establishes the city of Rome, which we theoretically have a date for, at least in myth, 
because the founding is celebrated on April 21st, and the date from which Romulus was said to have started ruling as king is 753 BCE. He is chosen as its king by its people, he gets approval from Numitor and Jupiter, and then he establishes a lot of the civil and military traditions of Rome at this time. He divided the three tribes of locals into wards or councils known as Curia. They were allotted land in the city. The Curia were governed by tribunes. Each Curia was required to have a military levy of 100 men, known as a century. And each Curia also was supposed to supply 10 men as cavalry, which led to 300 total from the founding of Rome. And they were given the name Calares, meaning swift, and became the king's guard. So the Calares were the bodyguards of Roman kings, not the Praetorian Guard. That was emperors. But yeah, there's a lot of history here, a lot of like, ooh, this is where we get this tradition. Romulus also establishes the Senate. He picked 100 men from leading families. He called them patres, or father, creating the patrician class. So, you know, setting up the class structure of Rome, picking the Senate. To grow the other social class, the plebeians, Romulus also is said to have outlawed infanticide. Don't know why that was an issue we had to work on. And he offered asylum to any man who came to Capitoline Hill, one of the other hills in Rome, allowing any freeman or slaves to become citizens of Rome. So, you know, sets up all this stuff, starts invoking people. You kind of see some of the stuff that the Romans at least like to talk about. Next, though, in the saga of the founding of Rome, there is the infamous incident of the rape of the Sabine women. Not necessarily that way, by the way. It's a very old-fashioned use of the word. In Latin, the same root is for, like, to steal or to grab. But don't worry, I'll explain what that means. If you, You've probably heard this term before, but if you don't know. Basically, there's way more single dudes in Rome than marriageable women, and none of the neighboring tribes are willing to intermarry. Romulus goes down with like, all his neighbors, and none of them will do this. So to solve this, Romulus arranges a massive harvest festival and games. He invites all the neighboring tribes to come, and they do so, especially the nearby Sabine tribe. So the Sabines come in mass at a prearranged signal. Roman men swoop down and abduct all all women of a marriageable age, especially those of the Sabines, because there's so many of them, they push their men back. Not really clear about like how necessarily violent this is. According to Livy, Romulus then implored the kidnapped women to take Roman husbands and offer them appropriate citizenship in Rome, requisite civil and property rights. Since this whole thing is probably a myth, you can interpolate that any way you like. But at the very least, the Roman historians, when talking about Romulus, were like, no, 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 we, we gave them fair deals, you know? We were trying to negotiate these bridal arrangements, but the other tribes weren't having it, so we just went straight to the source. Anyway, this, naturally, annoyed all of Rome's neighbors, and they might have defeated Romulus and the Romans if they had acted as a united front, but they didn't. So first, the armies of neighboring Latin towns assaulted one at a time and were all defeated. This also establishes some uh, Roman traditions about spoils of war. Look up Spoila Optima, but Romulus is supposed to have taken the first one. Anyway, he conquered those cities, and then invited the families of the women now living in Rome to also come to Rome. So, like like I said, it's a little weird, you know. The, the language is very loaded these days, but the historians did not want it to be quite as shady. But then the Sabians actually show up at the Battle of Locus Curtis. They have captured the Roman citadel through bribery, so they get to assault from the Romans on fortifications. They are a fierce foe. The battle goes on and on, but the battle ends when the women who have been taken into Rome, uh, many of them are now wives and mothers to Roman citizens, you know, they're part of the people. They come between the two armies, they sue for peace. Romulus negotiates with the Sabine king, Titus Titius, or possibly Tatius, Titus Tattletale, and they become joint rulers of Rome for a time. So there's a two kingship thing going on. Now, Romulus is said to have ruled Rome for 37 years. He also conquered nearby territory and waged war on local enemies. Lots of this is probably like explaining why Rome was rivals with neighboring city, states, nations, tribes, whatever. But then, after his years are up, according to tradition, he disappears in a whirlwind or a storm while he's out reviewing his troops. The most common version of this myth, though not the only one, we'll come back to that, is that he was taken up by Mars to join the gods on Olympus, and then he was syncretized with the cult of Quirinus, which takes us to our next phase of the folklore. So, who's Quirinus? Quirinus is the name of an arguably archaic Roman deity who, as far as I can tell, seems to have been fairly popular in older Rome, but was phased out of depictions in later Rome. Scholarship has kind of managed to figure out that he was probably part of a triad of deities, which included Jupiter and Mars, called the Archaic Triad, who were worshipped on the Capitoline Hill. And we can assume this because the hierarchy of Roman priests has been around since the days of the Roman kingdom. And the 
priest of Quirinus, the high priest of Quirinus, was like third in line after the priest of Jupiter and the priest of Mars. So you can tell that he used to be a big deal, but obviously kind of faded out because it's not as popular mythographically. You can also spell the name uh, Quirinus with a C, Quirinus, Quirinus, and Quirinius. So there's a lot of different ways you can do the vowels in this. Now, those C spellings, I mentioned the first two there could be started with a C. Those may be important because a possible etymology for this name is the nearby Sabine town of Cures, or Cures. Anyway, Quirinus may have actually been a Sabine war god who was transplanted to Rome. This could kind of go with some of the themes we've talked about with, you know, Romulus kind of bringing the tribes together. Another commonly attested etymology is wielder of the spear. Spears being often seen in Quirinus's depictions, what we have of them. Additionally, one of the seven hills of Rome was named after him. There is the Quirinine Hill. And allegedly, this was a settlement where Sabines lived. So it kind of fits together to the story so far. There is also another possible etymology. It's the same root word as Quirites or Quirites. I like Quirites better. This is the term for Roman citizens during peacetime, basically splitting up like when you're at peacetime, these are your civil duties. And when you're at war, these are your civil duties. In the archaic triad, Quirinus' rule seems to be associated with civil society and the economy. He may also have been a war god then because Mars was a little bit more of a harvest god before the Romans got really, really syncretized with the Greeks. So I'm not really sure. Like, I've been up and down the internet, like, trying to find sources on this, and it's just a lot of, like, speculation and general ideas and etymology. I'm a big Rome guy, and I hadn't really heard a lot about Quirinus until FGO did this, so it's very archaic and a little opaque. Anyway, sometime after he vanished, Romulus became conflated with the cult of Quirinus, and thus was worshipped as Romulus Quirinus, with a hyphen in there. This really solidified somewhere around the 1st century BCE. Now, in Plutarch's Life of Romulus, part of his Parallel Lives series, he reports a story that after vanishing, a Roman noble encountered Romulus while traveling, possibly on the Quirinine Hill, and Romulus told him to tell the Romans that he was Quirinus. So, that's a great urban legend. Now, in Ovid's Metamorphoses, he describes Mars asking Jupiter for permission to deify Romulus and his wife, Hercilla, and they are taken up into Olympus as the deities Quirinus and Hora, respectively. So, yeah, again, a lot of recurring themes here. There's also an epithet for Janus or Janus later, known as Janus Quirinus, which seems to be related to Janus' status as a liminal deity, Janus the two-faced god, as both a bringer of beginnings and endings, and so he was responsible for the beginning and ending of wartime. But, again, this could just be a verb. Epithets are not necessarily meant to directly conflate the characters. They're just, you know, using verbs. Now, there is some interesting scholarship that Romulus and Quirinus may have been a split divinity to begin with, like they were one figure that was split apart and then brought together, and Romulus could be what is known as a Dema or Dema deity, those who create a staple item for their culture, possibly by sacrificing themselves and being disseminated into the land, you know, Osiris style and also some other things. By the way, that line took me like three reads to do. I don't know what the heck is up with me today. Anyway, in this version... Both Romulus and Quirinus are associated with the grain spelt, a very popular staple crop, and it is noted that during the last day of the festival, Fornicalia, which is dedicated to Fornax, the goddess of the oven and bread, is called Quirinalia, so it's Quirinus' feast day, also called the Feast of Fools, but that's not related right now. So in another version of Romulus' death, which is told by Plutarch, Romulus is set upon by senators and torn apart. Each senator takes a piece of his body home to bury in their land to hide it, and then their lands grow grain. This follows a myth theme. This is a great new word I found out. A particle or format for a myth, basically the meme particle version, but for myths, of the Dema archetype, noting that Quirinus may have been associated with harvesting of grain, and because they are celebrated on similar days, the founding hero becomes the god of grains, might be the original myth form, which was later divided and then reconflated. As I said, there actually seems to have been some attempts by Roman historians to demythify their founding a little bit. So it could have been like, ah, uh, he was normal. And then, nah, he was a god. But he was also already a god. I don't know. I'm speculating here. You can go look up the whole Dema deity. It's spelled D-E-M-A. Also, by the way, in Rome, they sometimes use Quirinus as a surname for Hercules, Hercules Quirinus. I don't know why, but Herc was a big deal to the Romans as well. 
Now, Quirinius' position as a deity seems to have degraded over time in Rome. He became increasingly obscure, which led to him being wholly syncretized as being the deified Romulus. And it's got the point where I can't really find any hard and fast info for the historical Quirinus, as you can see above. There's debates on his exact origins, the etymology of his name, what role in society. Like, I can't even find people agreeing on what god he was. So he definitely got more archaic and obscure as time went on. Though we do have, you know, evidence of coinage, names, etc. So there's something there, but where exactly it starts, it's hard to tell. Romulus, on the other hand, stayed very popular in Roman folklore. He was connected to Aeneas as a mythic ancestor of the Roman people. He was connected to the first dynasty of kings in Rome. And then, through Aeneas and so on, he was looped back into the later Roman imperial dynasties. This is kind of hence the whole holy progenitor, the divine ancestor thing you see in fate. The image of the she-wolf suckling the twins is an icon which is often used to represent Rome itself, in fact. So, big recurring folkloric elements, strong symbology. If you want more Romulus facts, TM, check out Plutarch. I'll try and put Life of Romulus uh, translation link in the description. Anyway, that's just history and folklore. We're not even to lore yet, with an L. And in the raw, this is like 17 minutes long, so give me a second to switch gears, and then we'll come back for fate stuff. All right, let's jump into lore after that short edit break. Hopefully I didn't stumble over my words too much. As you can see, there was a lot in that previous segment. It was very dense, so I felt like I had to stumble through it a couple of times. I had to retake a few of my lines. But let's go into lore. That'll be a little bit shorter. Though it still has some pretty interesting stuff in there. And unfortunately, this is your last chance to pull the break. This is your big boy spoiler lore. Are you gone yet? Okay. So Romulus equals Quirinus appears in Lost Belt 5, Part 2 Olympus, and is the holder of the title of... Grand Lancer, which does make sense given one of the proposed etymology of Quirinus's is literally spear holder. He is spear guy. Now, regular heroic spirit Romulus has been associated with Quirinus since his profile in FGO materials, like from the way back, you know, a couple of years into the game, I think. And this includes the version where he vanishes and he's subsequently deified as a new god. So the seeds were planted already. FGO already knew about these little tidbits. So we got to go in there. Now, despite being a fairly commonplace three-star servant in-game, you know, he's pretty standard. Romulus, the holy progenitor, has always been set in lore to be quite strong. It is noted that his original form should have a very high rank of divinity as a demigod who got deified after death because Mars is thought of very highly ranked to the Romans. But his exceptional levels of imperial privilege let him seal his own divinity. He should probably have as much divinity as Heracles, but, you know, we're here. So regular Romulus' spear... Magna Wolse Magnum is attested to as a spear he thrust into the Palatine Hill to found Rome, and also it takes the form of a tree Sylvia saw in a dream as a metaphor for Rome. I can't really source either of these. I mentioned in an earlier story that Romulus did plow a furrow around the Palatine Hill, and there are some poems about the dreams of Illa or Ilia, which is another way of writing Rhea Sylvia. And Sylvia's name does come from the same root word for forest. There's also some other, like, forest symbolism in the Aeneid. And the Palatine Hill is also the site of the Lupercal, where, you know, Remulus and Remus were left out to be found by the she-wolf and suckled in a cave. They were left under a tree, so I don't know. There's some stuff there. Anyway, it is called the Spear of Beginning and is meant to be a counterpoint to the Spear of Endings, Rongominiad. So, you know, it's supposed to be in parallel, and obviously his original version doesn't feel like that. Romulus is also called the King of Nation Building in Fate, one of our many famous kings. Oh, very frequent style you've seen in there. And also, as seen from the notes in the spear, he is meant to be a counterpart and in similar strength to Artoria Lancer. Again, his original showing doesn't really feel like that, but I believe the FGO designers have gone on record in interviews. I've always seen these quoted. Uh, if somebody has a source, you know, you can drop it in the comments. But I've read some translations and materials and stuff. They wanted him to have a similar impact to her, but just they didn't know how to design units in, you know, year zero, basically. So it's a rough start. Now, regular Romulus does have a second NP, Moles Necessere, which goes back to the death of Remus, which is why I told you about that part. It's a bounded field noble phantasm that instantly raises fortress walls from the ground, basically around the Palatine Hill. So, you know, they know a lot of these stuff. Now, normally a divine spirit like Quirinus wouldn't be able to be summoned even as a grand servant, but Romulus equal Quirinus has such a strong connection with humanity. He is a god which could be said to represent Rome itself, the deified mythic founder. He can be summoned as Grand Lancer, which gives him a saint graph befitting his power output. 
according to interviews uh, in Famitsu, Romulus equal queerness qualifies as the peak of both power and legend in terms of Lancers. I don't know about that exactly, but being the god of all Rome is pretty strong. His noble phantasm in this form, per aspera ad astra, our aspirations take us to the stars, is fundamentally the same as his normal form, spear. It's basically an expression of both the hope and arrogance of mankind to expand to all corners and even reach the stars, taking the forms of spears of light. It is basically the entire weight of human civilization, with Western civilization especially often traced directly back to Rome for a lot of reasons, and he converts that into offensive power. It is said to be able to both destroy and clear the way, and also to create a new civilization after the way is created. Uh, they don't really use the creation aspect in-game, but it's part of his profile translations. Also, by the way, this motto, which is the name of the Noble Phantasm, is immensely popular, is used by organizations the world over, and is recurring in popular culture. It's the motto of Starfleet from Star Trek, for instance. It's a very strong vibe. Per aspera ad astra. Now, as Romulus Equal Quirinus, he does have a second NP. It's his third skill. Nine Lives Roma. It's weird... It probably has to do with Heracles' own association with the Palatine Hill and with the name Quirinus. There's some notes in some of the translations about it possibly just being Ares taught it to Romulus, or maybe there's some myth about Hercules being Romulus' dad, but I didn't find anything about that. I don't know. I don't know where they're going, their obscure sources. They're, you know, deep diving in libraries. I don't really got time for that. I've had, like, what, a week since the last time I did the video like this to do this? Anyway, it's basically... Romulus's version of Heracles' fighting style. He uses his fists, and they hit like spears, and are able to extinguish lifeless monsters. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, as a playable, summonable servant, Romulus Equal Quirinus is no longer in his grand class container, and as such, his ranks and certain skills have been degraded so he can be summonable, but his existence was recorded by the Novum Caldea when he actually appeared in story. So regular Romulus was an antagonist in Septum, if you've played Septim and remember it, you know why I did that question mark in there. And he did also appear in the Temple of Time as a notable little cameo. And he also has a regular interlude and some rank-up quests and stuff. Romulus Equal Queerness also will have a Quartz interlude. It involves fighting chickens, so I don't know what the heck that's about. But yeah, there you go. Let's dive into those mechanics. So, let's do them mechanics. Mechanicals. Mechanicums. Romulus Equal Queerness is a new SSR 5-star Lancer. He has a heavy attack lean. He will be the highest attack in Lancers until being edged out by Vishra in a few months' time, but does have the lowest HP in Lancers tied with Karna. So, makes sense. He is quick arts arts buster buster with decent hit counts, and so a solid NP gain. You know, pretty alright for two arts cards in his hit counts. Which is a little bit different from some historical Lancers. Lancers are very often known for their QQABB decks previously. This is more of an arts and buster mix, because you may actually want to spam his NP, and they figured it out. Speaking of which, his NP is a doozy. So, it is an AoE buster, which is the lowest inherent damage multiplier, but when you are the fattest attack in Lancers, at least for like six months, really more like nine months actually, it's a big deal. It also deals bonus damage to Roman enemies by default, and that bonus damage can be increased per stack of the Roman trait, maxing out at 10 stacks, 20% per stack. This means if you get a lot of stacks, that's big. It's a lot of extra damage. It also makes... All allies and enemies gain the Roman trait for five turns, and also increases team attack based on overcharge for three turns, starting at 10%. So, you fire this off, you do big damage. If you didn't kill the enemies, the enemies are all Roman, your allies are all Roman to gain benefits from future stats that this guy does, and you get team attack up. It's very solid. Now, if you're concerned about getting that trait damage, though, guess what? Don't bother! First skill is a Charisma, 10-20% to 20 crit up as well, and a further 20-30% to 30 crit up for allies who are already Roman, so that's a 50% crit buff and a 20% attack buff, and also a high chance to slap all enemies with the Roman trait for 5 turns. At max level, this is a 5 turn cooldown. Your enemies will never not be Roman, at least until you blow up a wave. We'll talk about that a little bit later. His second skill is a 2 hits, 3 turns invincible, a 20-30% to 30 battery, and also drops 10 stars, a very decent skill all around. And his final skill is another pretty interesting way to get those trait stracks in there. He has a 20-30% to 30 buster up for three turns, he increases his star absorb for one turn, and a three-turn buff where he puts the Roman trait on enemies when he lands a crit. So you have multiple ways to stack the Roman trait and get extra stuff in there, plus your usual steroids. His passives are Magic Resistance A for debuff resistance, Independent Action B+, for inherent crit damage, 
and a special divinity which not only gives him a damage plus, but also a 9% buster effectiveness. Yes, he has an inherent Madness Enhancement style booster. The damage is big. Romulus Quirinus is AoE, but he can lay down a very heavy bonus damage on enemies over time, or if they're already Roman. And this allows him to bring a lot of pain with that fairly large attack stat, and fairly persistent attack increases. He has a Charisma, you fire his NPs another 10%, he's got steroids for his booster already, he's got some crit stuff. You will do some big slapping. He can also amp a team pretty well, giving them significant crit and attack mods as well, so he can work as an offensive supporter as well as your primary damage dealer. Honestly, the thing he's weakest at is, like, normal fast farming, like you're doing events and the enemies are all chumps, because you honestly don't need his excessive damage cap to wipe a wave. Other simpler servants will do that. But if you're in a little bit of a grind fest, some of these enemies are chunky, I don't know if you've noticed, he can slap pretty hard. So, in terms of a team comp, having capacity for buster and or crit, Merlin slides right in. He gives him more HP, he gives him more hard defenses, he gives him even more damage output and throws another 20% NP on there so you can take it into the territory of using powerhouse CEs like Golden Sumo. Waver's generic buffs are also good. Damage cuts, crit ups, attack ups, very good. Now, funny enough, for budget support, there are a couple of funny ones for this. Boudica is actually crazy good to support Romulus because she delivers, if you've raised her skills anyway and uh, done her rank ups, she gives a team-wide 40-60% bonus damage for Roman targets for three turns. So that's just another 60% damage increase on Romulus' NP, and a 30-50% to 50% crit up for the team for three turns. Her NP and other skills can also provide other buffs, amping your attack, amping your survivability, giving you the stall strats for the long haul. Leonidas is also a lancer who provides you more offensive support and more tanking potential. So if you're in the long haul, you got plans and strategy. If you're using him as a support, like he's your semi-support, you're better off using just any old ST lancer and just having his NP give your buddies Roman effects. There's not really any extant Roman servants who are really good in the overlap. Like, a lot of them are arts or quick, so they don't necessarily go together. But you never know, you might be able to come up with a funny strategy using, like, Nero Bride or something. Eh. Pray for more Roman servants. Now, for CEs, if you want just fast farming, he has a minimum 20% battery, you can case scope him. If you're also using him with other battery servants, you can go with your usual 50% starters, like Golden Sumo or Aerial Drive. In general, I would say you want to amp offense you want to focus first on np damage since he doesn't do that natively that's one of the offensive buffs he doesn't do and then after that buster or crit damage because those are just part of his kit and if you're doing a stall team if you're going for the long haul anyway you might even go for something like heaven's feel or black grail for maximum np damage output because he can slap really hard now your ascension mats shouldn't be too difficult though if you are counting for future servants you should note he does take five eggs to max ascension Unfortunately, skills are more painful as a second manner servant in a brand new story release. Each skill needs 24 spheres and 15 fruits, and there is actually a demand to bump some of these. You will want to get that first skill maxed out so you can amplify his trait damage like all the time. So watch out for that one, guys. Now, Romulus Equal Quirinus debuts in the Olympus Part 2 banner, which should be soon TM, as I am working on this. And as an SSR, he will be somewhere in all future Lucky Bag campaigns, because he is limited. But also... He will appear on the Summon Banner for one of the Grail Front events, Etu Brute, which should happen in about a year. He is also part of Interlude Campaign 15, but doesn't have a banner at that time. He's just part of the campaign. That's where he gets his Quartz Interlude. As far as I have double-checked, he is not like a bonus servant at any other events, really, or anything up there. So we'll see if he's got any more future story appearances. We'll see. Anyway, there you go. That's the whole thing. I know it's a long one, but I hope you enjoyed it. There's your Grand Roma. So, it's time to go to the outro. Hey, be sure to give this video a like if you liked it. You can also leave any comments in the comment section down below. Let them know if you did good on the banner. If you're new here, subscribe so you can get more wanted as they come out and also other stuff. We've got a big boy show of Let's Talk FGO, our weekly podcast about FGO. We're going to be talking about the full spoiler deep dive of Lost Belt 5 Part 2 Olympus. So if you want our thoughts on Grand Lancer and many other things, check it out. It'll be live as well. Live streamed. Also, be sure to ring that bell for notifications so you always know we post a new video because sometimes we stream at weird times and sometimes I post videos at weird times. So get that bell so you know. You can also join our channel membership, by the way. Click on the join button or the link in the description to get access to membership badges and emotes. You can support us on Patreon to get this episode early. And also, just in general, I want to throw this out there as just another little reminder. If Wanted blesses your timeline, if it is a perfectly good catalyst for your servant, as many people in the comments are now attesting to, you can see them right down there. If you get your Romulus Queerness under budget, 
consider throwing a couple of bucks our way. You could drop us a super thanks and just, you know, chip us in an equivalent of one or two St. Quartz. Don't need to blow an 80-pack on us, just saying. Give us some love, and also tell your friends about this video if you thought this was a cool history lesson about Romulus and or Quirinus. Because trust me, it is like 90 degrees outside. It says fire weather on my computer. It's hot. I'm dying out here. But I still did like a 20-minute history snippet on Romulus Quirinus and stuff. Anyway, with all that, I'll let you go. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Stay tuned for the next Wanted. God, is that Voyager? I think it's Voyager. That's going to be weird. It's going to be double weird because I don't really know anything about Fate Requiem because they won't localize it. Anyway, I'll see you guys then. Be sure to check out Let's Tech FGO once again. going to be live. It's going to be a special episode. Get your spoiler britches on. All right, let's go.